Hi, and welcome to Lecture 4 of Psych 2317, Statistical Methods in Psychology. Now, in Lecture 3, we learned how to compare a single score to a distribution of scores. And from that, we were able to answer two equivalent types of questions. First, we were able to ask what proportion of scores are greater or less than some given score. And we used examples of ACT scores to illustrate the, the technique for answering this question. We were also able to ask an equivalent question, and that is what is the probability of randomly selecting a score greater or less than some given score? So if you haven't watched lecture three, you really should go back and look at that. And we introduced some key concepts of the normal distribution, as well as an online app for making computations of this proportion and probability that, uh, that answer these questions. Now you might also recall way back in lecture one that in the game of research, our goal is to test models. And in statistical language, what we're doing is we're testing models of a population. We do this by measuring samples. So for example, if we were to do this, we might measure a bunch of people, say take a sample of people that we can attain as participants in some research, and then we might measure them on some scale, and we then might take the mean of that scale. And so this would be the mean of that sample that we would then measure. So that's what we do in research. Now the big question that guides lecture four today is given this sample mean, how does it compare to the distribution of all possible sample means? So we're moving closer to answering questions that we really care about in research by being able to answer questions about the mean of a sample that we obtain compared to what we would expect from a population. So to walk us through this today, I wanted to start with a guiding example. So let's consider a test whose scores are normally distributed with a mean of, let's say, mu equals 16 and a standard, a, a standard deviation of, let's say, sigma equals 5. So the question is this, what means would we expect if we were to take samples of size n equals 5? Okay, so can you picture this? We've got a distribution of scores that are centered at 16 and have a standard deviation, which remember controls the spread of the distribution, of 5. And if we were to take samples of size n equals 5, so take 5 of these scores at random, what kinds of sample means would we expect? Now I want you to start thinking about that. We're going to answer that question very thoroughly in today's lecture. What we need to do in order to answer this question is we need to construct the distribution of all possible sample means. So to learn about these sampling distributions, as we can call them, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to use the distributions module of JASP, which remember you can download from jasp-stats.org. It's a free download. We're going to use this module to quickly see what kinds of means we would get from such samples. So this distributions module gives us a very nice way to, to do this. And then we're going to use an online Java applet to simulate what happens when we take thousands of these sample means. Now, we're about to go there and see this, but it can be found at the following website, and this will be linked in the video description below. Or alternatively, if you have a mobile device, you can scan that QR code and get to this Java applet. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. So let's do the first things first and put down my, my pen real quick. We're going to switch to JASP. In fact, we need to open JASP. Uh, this will be probably, this is the first video uh, that has used JASP this semester. So I'll just quickly say something about JASP. Let me go to a browser and go to jasp-stats.org. 
Uh, this is a great piece of software for many reasons, one of which is uh, that you can do Bayesian statistics in it, which we'll talk about later this semester. But it's a free download. You go to, to that website, uh, and of course I'll link this down below, but you just click on Download JASP and follow the instructions. It's a nice piece of software. Now I'm going to go ahead and I have installed it on this computer already, so I'm going to open it up here. And in fact, let me give most of the screen available. So now, real quickly, you need to have the most recent version of JASP to do this because we're going to be using something called the distributions module, which is, um, I believe, was added in version 0.13. So if you have 0.12 or below, you're not going to be able to do this. So update the update JASP, and, and you'll be able to do this. Uh, to get the distributions module, you just simply go up to the plus sign up here where it says Show Modules Menu and click on that. You're going to check the box for distributions. And you'll notice then that a little distributions module comes up here. But you might notice it's grayed out. I can't do anything with it. That's because to use JASP and to use most of the modules that JASP includes, you have to have some data loaded. Now it turns out for what we're going to do, it absolutely does not matter which data set you, you put in. So we're going to simply go over here, we're going to click the three lines, and we're going to go to Open, Data Library, and then I'm going to go, um, you can pick any of these, but this one's pretty simple. I'm going to go to the T-Tests folder, and I'm going to click, let's see, I'm going to click the Kitchen Rolls experiment. And so that's, uh, that's going to be a bunch of, bunch of stuff up here. Nothing that I really care about. What I really care about now is that the distributions module has now appeared. And so I'm going to click on it and go to continuous and normal. Now you'll notice there's a lot of different distributions up here, but I care about the normal distribution right now. So I'm going to click on that. And what it starts with is the standard normal distribution. Now, there's a lot of things that you can do with the distributions module. We're going to do a very small subset of these things today. The first thing that I want to do is I want to put in a distribution that uh, is similar to the one that I used in my guiding example. Now, remember from that guiding example, we wanted a distribution that was normal with mean mu equals 16 and standard deviation 5. So let's go back to JASP and you'll notice here under parameters there's four options mu sigma squared, mu sigma, mu tau, or mu kappa. I want to choose mu sigma because this is going to parameterize or describe the distribution in terms of a mean and a standard deviation. You'll notice now that these options here change to mu and sigma. I'm going to select 16 for the mu and 5 for the sigma. Now that's going to mess up my plot over here because the scale on this plot is from negative 3 to 3. I'm going to change this to something reasonable. Now I know that a normal distribution, most of its mass is within three standard deviations of the mean. So I'm going to subtract 3 times 5 from 16 and get a lower limit of, let's say, 1 and I'm going to add 3 times 5 to 16 to get 31. And that's going to give me a nice, once it updates, it's going to give me a nice uh, view of the normal distribution. Now notice the normal distribution is centered just to the right of 15. It's centered at 16 and this distance is about 5. Okay, So that gives me something to look at. This is my population of scores. Now I'm going to click on the Generate and Display Data menu. I'm going to make a new variable name. I'm going to call it Sample. And under Number of Samples, I'm going to put in my sample size. I'm going to put in 5. Okay. Now you'll notice now that this little variable that I've generated, uh, it now appears in the variable list down below. So I'm going to click on it and move it over to Get Variable from Data Set. And what's going to happen is down below this, this curve, you're going to see, and I don't think my picture will be in the way too much here. Let's see if I can scroll up a little bit. Yeah, not too much, but that's okay. I think we can move this here and then scroll up a little. Yeah, it's still the same. Okay, hang on one second. There we go. One of the things you'll notice here is that this then has a mean. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to click 
the button that says draw samples. Now I'm getting a little bit too much into the point click, point click, what am I doing? I am simulating drawing samples of size five from a distribution that has mean 16 and standard deviation five. So that's when I click the draw samples button, that's what it's going to do. And when I do that, this little set of descriptive statistics is going to update. In fact, you'll see that it updates and there's a mean here. This mean is 16.273. So that means that on this simulated sample, again, we pulled five scores from this distribution, the mean was 16.273. So the mean was right around in here. Okay, let's do it again. Now this time, the mean is 15.123, so it's, a, it's about right here. Do it again. So every time click on draw samples, ooh, this time I got a, uh, a mean of, well, 16 again. <laughs> so I just keep doing this and I'm just sort of visually keeping track of the mean. This time the mean was 14. And you, know, you can do this as long as you want, uh, as long as you have the patience for. This mean was a little bit bigger, this mean was 18. But the point is this. Every time you do this, you get a slightly different mean. Even though the mean of this distribution of scores is 16, the means of my samples are not 16. In fact, they vary. There's quite a bit of uncertainty with respect to those means. But one of the things that you might notice is that the means are always, well not always, but every, every example we've done, they are really always in this little center region. So it would be nice if I could just keep doing this and keep doing this and keep doing this and every time I get a mean, write it down and then plot the distribution of those means after I do like, you know, thousands of them. And the answer is you can absolutely do that, but you would have to be really patient to do it in JASP. So I'm not gonna do it in JASP right now, but this is a great way to get some intuition behind what's going on. For now, I'm going to close out JASP and save some processing resources on my computer. I don't need to save this. And I'm going to go to this, um, let me show you again. Hang on one second. I'm gonna go back to this website right here. This is a little Java applet. It's onlinestatbook.com slash stat underscore sim slash sampling underscore dist. Uh, it's a long address. Again, there's a link in the description, but it's going to take me to this site. And it's going to be a little simulation of these sampling distributions, these distributions of sample means. If I click begin, it's gonna give me a picture. Now, uh, this picture is missing some stuff. Let me click begin one more time. Ah, there it is, it just wasn't, wasn't quite big enough. So I'm gonna move, oops, it's resizing on me. There we go. So you should still be able to see all of this on the screen. So you'll notice here that this is a normal distribution. Uh, it's a little more pixelated than we might uh, have gotten in JASP, but it's basically the same thing. But you'll notice that the mean is 16 and standard deviation is five. This is the same distribution of scores. The cool thing about this little simulation is if I click on um, animated, if I um, click on animated, it will pull down a sample of five measurements and then compute its mean and then it will stick that mean down here. Okay, so this is this was the mean of this set of five measurements. And I can do it again. Okay, and so there's the mean there. We'll do it again. And every time it pulls one of those means down, it just stacks it down here, kind of like it's making a distribution. In fact, that's exactly what it's doing. And we can, this is just like what we did in JASP a second ago, except this time it's keeping track of them visually. We'll do it one more time, just so you get a, 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 an idea of what happens when you pull samples from this distribution and then compute its mean and stack the means up. Now, what I'm interested in, let's, let's not lose sight of this, what I'm interested in is what is the shape of the distribution of these sample means? That means I've got to do this lots and lots of times. So thankfully in this applet, it's built in buttons where instead of doing it one at a time and then stacking things up, I can just click the number, say five, and it'll do it five times and stack up those five means. And it'll do it again, and it'll do it again, and it'll do it again. In fact, I can click 10,000. And right before my eyes, it did 10,000 repetitions of this game of pulling down a sample, computing its mean, and then stacking it up. 
And in fact, I can do this 100,000 times. And right before my eyes, it updates to a distribution. Now, I'm clicking 100,000 every time I say something, about once every second. I am now up to 1,010,026 repetitions. And you might notice something, okay? You might notice that this distribution of means looks normal. That's interesting. You might also notice that this distribution of means is centered right under the center of the original distribution. That's pretty cool. And then one more thing you might notice is that the standard deviation of this distribution is smaller than the standard deviation of this distribution, it has less spread. In fact, there's an estimate of the standard deviation right here. It's 2.24 compared to the original distribution, which had a, a standard deviation of 5. In fact, that's interesting enough that I think we really ought to take a moment to write that down. So what do we notice? Well, let's just recap. First of all, again, this distribution of sample means appears normal. We also notice that the mean of this distribution, and by this distribution, I mean this, the distribution of sample means, that mean is 16. That's the same as the original distribution of scores. And then finally, we notice that the standard deviation of this distribution, the sample mean distribution, is smaller than the original distribution of scores. This leads me to wonder, these samples were size n equals 5. What would happen if we were to increase the sample size to 25? Well, we can easily investigate this. Let's go back to this app. We're going to clear all this and start again. In the first group, I'm going to pull samples of size 5, but to compare, I'm going to pull the mean of samples of size 25. Okay. So again, just to show you how this works, first we're going to pull a sample of size 5. So there it is. And now it's going to pull a sample of size 25. It's going to take a minute to do this because it's literally got to do this 25 times. Boom. And then there's that mean. Okay, so now I'm going to press this little five button to simulate doing that five times, five more times, five more times. Let's go ahead and cut to the chase. Let's click 100,000, 100,000, 100,000. Let's get up to a million repetitions of this. So I'm almost there. There, I've done this a little over a million times. And you'll notice the same thing as we, did as we noticed before. The distribution of sample means of size 5 and of size 25 is centered at exactly the same place as the original distribution. The mean of both of these distributions is 16. But now notice the standard deviation even gets smaller. Standard deviation up here was smaller than this one. Okay. The standard deviation down here is even smaller. It's all the way down to 1. So what is it that happens when we make samples of bigger and bigger size? Well, it turns out, oops, let me put this down here. It turns out that it gets even smaller. So all of this investigation with JASP and with this, out and with this applet leads us to one of the biggest results in the course. This result is called the Central Limit Theorem. Now I'm going to give you kind of a mathematical statement of this theorem. It's not a very precise statement, so mathematicians among you might not be very happy, but I think this, this cuts the nice medium between a specific mathematical statement and an intuitive statement. So here's how it goes. Let's consider a normal distribution. Now I'll put normal in parentheses. I'll say why in just a second. But let's consider a normal distribution with a given mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma. And let's suppose that we take samples of size n. Okay. Then the distribution of sample means has the following three properties. First, it is approximately normal. Okay. We saw that right here. These blue distributions are the distributions of sample means and they are both normal shaped. Again, I know they're kind of pixelated, but you get the picture. They are basically that same mound shaped distribution. Not only are they approximately normal, but the mean of this distribution, this sampling distribution, has the same mean as the original distribution. In other words, its mean is equal to mu. And then finally, it has a standard deviation that's smaller. 
And in fact, it's equal to this expression right here. It's equal to what you get when you take sigma, the original standard deviation, and divide by the square root of n. Now that's cool. Check this out, guys. You can do this. This distribution up here had a standard deviation of 5, right? We set it up that way. According to the central limit theorem, if we were to take a sample of size 25, then the distribution of sample means would have a standard deviation equal to 5 divided by the square root of the sample size, the square root of 25. So it would be 5 divided by square root of 25, which is 5 divided by 5, which is 1. And you know, that's exactly what we get right here. This is no accident. This is a mathematical fact. So I want to make a couple of notes about this and then conclude our video with a quick example of how one would use these facts in a problem. First of all, let's talk a little bit about uh, naming. This standard deviation, this sigma divided by square root of n, it's a very important quantity. It's so important it has its own name. It's called the standard error of measurement. We often abbreviate this to SE. I'm going to highlight that because you're going to see that notation a lot. Anytime you see SE, what we mean is this right here. It's that standard deviation of the distribution of sample means. It takes a lot of words to say all that, so that's why we abbreviate it. And then second, I want to make a mention. Even if the original distribution of scores is not normal, the distribution of sample means is approximately normal uh, if the sample size is large enough, okay? So if your sample size is large enough, usually in the 25 to 30 range or bigger, then your, di your distribution of sample means is approximately normal. I will encourage you to play with this. You can change this thing up with your mouse and make it very not normal and then do the same thing. See what happens to the sampling distribution. I'm not going to do that right now. I'm going to let you do that. Okay, so let's play with this just a little bit. Let's see how we would use this to solve a problem. So here's an example. Let's suppose we have 10 students who are randomly selected to take the ACT. And remember from our past lectures, the ACT has a mean of 21 and a standard deviation of 6. So here's my question that I have the tools to answer today. What is the probability that their mean score is greater than 25? Okay. So these are the kinds of questions, and you may not know it yet, but these are the kinds of questions you want to be able to ask. So let's look at a solution. What we are really wanting to know is, what is the probability that x bar, the sample mean, is bigger than 25? So how do we go about doing this? Well, step one is going to follow basically from the last lecture, from lecture three. We're going to convert to z-scores. But remember, a z-score has to be based on a particular distribution. This z-score is based on the distribution of sample means. So, what does that mean? That means that that distribution has a standard deviation equal to the standard error. So we've got to compute this standard error to know what our z-score is going to be. The standard error we find by taking sigma divided by the square root of n. So for this problem, that's 6 divided by square root of 10, which turns out to be 1.90. And so using that, we can compute the z-score just like we always would. We take the sample mean minus the mean mu of the distribution divided by the standard error in this case. So that's 25 divided by 21 divided by this standard error of 1.9. And that gives us a z-score of 2.11. So step two then is to find the probability that z is bigger than 2.11. How do we do this? Well, we had a very nice tool for that in the last lecture. It was this uh, applet. Let me reload it. Uh, this little shiny app that uh, I introduced in lecture three. So just re reload this thing real quickly. And remember that by default, this gives you a distribution of z scores. So all we've got to do is find the probability that uh, something is bigger than 2.11. So we want an upper tail at a value of 2.11. And so our resulting probability is 0 0.0174. And so from the online app, we can answer this question and the probability that their mean score is greater than 25 
turns out to be pretty low. It turns out to be 0 0.0174. What that's telling you is that with a sample of size 10, it's pretty unlikely that your mean is going to be four points away from the mean of the distribution itself. Okay, So the sample size really affects the probability of getting extreme means. That's kind of what this is saying. Okay, so let's finish up. We've got a couple of take homes and then we'll be done. First of all, uh, if we want to answer questions about samples, and we do, then we need to know something about the distribution of sample means. Well, today you now know something about that. And then remember, compared to the original distribution, the distribution of sample means has the same mean and it has a smaller standard deviation. And specifically, it has a standard deviation equal to this standard error. So you're, uh, this, this tells you that anytime you work a problem with sample means instead of just individual points, you're going to have to think about this standard error. So that's all for this video. Uh, we've gotten closer to what it is that we want to do as researchers, which is compare models of observed data one of the key tools is this notion of a distribution of sample means. This is really exciting. So I will see you at the next video and we'll take this even one step further. That's all for now.